We're going to have five more seats up front. Can I say something real quickly as we start off? Great. Um, so, hi everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. My name is Noel Ornonek. Um, I'm the executive director of Beta NYC, uh, the one who's been sending you messages and sometimes uh, harasses you via email. Um, so, apologize if you get one too many emails from us. We're still trying to figure out our communications infrastructure strategy. Most of you are here because of Meetup, so that's one platform. And then we also have a newsletter that we're trying to kick off. Uh, um, after this meeting, we're going to post up another announcement that we are, uh, well, actually on Monday, we're going to start sourcing ideas. Monday or Wednesday, sometime between that, we're going to start sourcing ideas for a newsletter that we're going to start kicking off, which is a community-oriented newsletter around civic technology in New York City. Uh, for those of you who were around and got the message, um, uh, Fab Five Freddy, uh, that's what we were riffing off of. Um, uh, Grandmaster Flash, uh, we're going to try to rekindle that um, this uh, second half of the year and try to institute a community newsletter. So look forward to that. Uh, I first want to say it's a really weird time to be in America. Uh, for those of us who are here uh, in this room, we all come from a different sort of privilege. We all have the time or the energy and the, the opportunity to be here on a Friday uh, midday and spend two hours with each other to talk about a very important issue called affordable housing. <laughs> and if you know uh, what's been happening in America, you've been paying attention, it's a really fucked up time. So um, uh, I just want to um, stand up here and recognize that we all have privilege and we should all recognize the privileges that we do have. And, it's, uh, um, and if you have an opportunity, spend this weekend with your friends and family and reflect on that privilege and think about how we can change um, the fucked up world that we're in. Um, I hope that uh, over the next few months, Beta NYC can use its, its energy and attention to hopefully address some of these inequalities. Uh, it's a privilege and honor to now turn this over to uh, some of the community organizers uh, in this community um, who have spearheaded this particular conversation this particular conversation hits my home uh, uh, deeply because if I have to move out of my apartment, I will not be able to live in my neighborhood. I live in Greenpoint and the median uh, rent uh, is now $1,000 more than what I am currently paying. And so, um, you know, we may live in a fucked up nation, uh, but we also lived in a fucked up city where people are losing their houses um, and the ability to live in the neighborhoods that they may have grown up in or that they have known for for uh, uh, many years. I live in Greenpoint longer than I've lived in the childhood home that I have. Um, and so I just wanna say uh, thank you to the community organizers who put this on. Uh, this is a very important topic uh, to understand about the sustainability of our city. Uh, I'm gonna hand this off to Lucio. I also wanna say thank you to the speakers uh, who volunteered to come uh, and give their time uh, to talk about this very important issue. Uh, so thank you for coming out, um, and uh, we're all ears to try to figure out how to solve the biggest problems that we have in the city. This is just one of those conversations that we want to focus on. So thank you for coming. Lucia. All right, hello. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Beta NYC's Beta Talks. I'm Lucio Tolentino. I'm a civic hacker, a data scientist, and one of the co-organizers of Beta NYC. So every month, we're going to try and host one of these Beta Talks that explore uh, the broadly defined intersection of government and technology. So we don't believe that technology can fix everything, but we have a, a working assumption that we can, it can fix some of the things. So first, I want to thank Civic Hall for letting us use the space for the event. They've been great uh, partners in fostering the civic technology in New York City. And if you work in the civic tech field, uh, Civic Hall has a membership pro program that grants you access to their awesome co-working space and all their great events. Also, a big thank you to Jolly and the Internet Society in the back for live streaming this event. Uh, we try really hard to make our events uh, accessible for everyone. And these folks make, it, uh, make that possible. So thanks to them. All right, so technology, data, and government. So we talk often uh, about how technology can be a transformative power for good. But perhaps more than we like to admit, the promise of technology and government is lackluster. So a great example is the NYC or the NYPD crash data that was released a couple years ago. 
a lot of civic hackers, myself included, uh, created a lot of really great visualizations around this data. Uh, and it was really interesting to see what they produced, but a lot of it didn't translate to useful information or useful insights for the NYPD to go off of. And I think part of the impediment to building truly revolutionized, uh, revolutionary civic tech is a dearth of understanding the complexities of an issue. It's not enough to tackle a particular aspect with an app thrown together in a weekend. We need to understand the issues before trying to solve it. So what we're going to do today is start the conversation from the beginning. I want to start by having an in-depth conversation, start by asking people useful, know the problems you'll run for the future. When we create a civic tech project, it's not really useful. Broadly speaking, the first is creating new houses, so that's uh, a part and the city uh, which the government owns or incentivizing developers to, uh, to include affordable housing units in their new building sites. And they do this through all the different ways that government usually incentivizes corporations. Today, the main way is to increase supply is that second option of incentivizing private, the private market. The famous example is the 421A tax program where developers got a tax break if 80% of the units are market rate and then the other 20% were set aside for affordable units. Uh, and then the second broad category is maintaining the affordable housing stock that we already have. Uh, this means maintaining the uh, NYCHA developments from back when government did build uh, affordable housing units. And these house around four, 400,000 residents. Uh, or providing Section 8 vouchers, which uh, provide rent educated about affordable housing and make our government better. So without further nonsense for myself, I'm going to introduce our panelists uh, ex and ask them to explain where they fit in. I'll ask them a couple questions and then we'll open it up to the audience for you guys to have. So panelists, please come up. Caitlin Brazil, the VP of Strategic Partnerships at Cambo. Moses Gates, Director of Community Planning and Design from the Regional Plan Association. Emily Goldman, the PhD candidate uh, in City and Regional Planning from Cornell University. And John Krauss. Hacker in chief from the blog Accused, uh, Accursed Wear. Yeah, that's out of <laughs> All right, so if you guys would all like to introduce yourselves, tell the audience a bit about your backgrounds, where we are now, uh, and how you came into the working realm of affordable housing. Caitlin? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay in the back? I have a bit of a cold, so if I sound a little off, I feel the way. Uh, I'm Caitlin Brazil. Uh, I am the Vice President for Strategic Partnerships at Canva. Um, maybe I'll give a little bit of background on Canva and then I can tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, so Canva is uh, based in Brooklyn. It's one of New York City's largest human services organizations. So uh, we have a, an array of different programs that help low and moderate income individuals, families, and communities. We reach about 45,000 New Yorkers annually. Uh, and through about 160 different programs throughout the five boroughs. Uh, housing is key and core to what we do. And I think we have uh, a number of different perspectives on housing affordability because of the diversity of the work that we do. So we do homelessness prevention, which includes things like helping people in housing court to avoid eviction. It can also include working with households who are behind on their rent and figuring out ways to help them pay off their rental arrears or get their electricity back on and uh, stay in their current units. It can also include helping tenants who are in uh, apartment buildings that are no longer being maintained at the level that they need to be maintained. Um, so we have a, a number of different kinds of strategies that we can use to help people stay in affordable housing. And, and one of the things I just want to note along, along those lines is that when we think of housing affordability and we think of affordable housing, um, there is also another important camp in New York City of affordable housing, and, it, and it's probably the camp that, that Nola's referring to, right, which is um, our rent-stabilized housing stock. And that's actually the biggest <laughs> chunk of housing in New York City, um, which is not subsidized and doesn't receive ongoing subsidies from the city and doesn't necessarily include people who are, I mean, Sometimes it does include people who are holding vouchers, but often is basically a private market transaction. And that is probably the trickiest, although perhaps most important, um, for continued preservation uh, because it doesn't have a continued additional cost. 
Um, one of the other things that Canva does is uh, we are a nonprofit developer of affordable housing. So in, in the same way that the government provides incentives and subsidies for uh, for-profit developers to create affordable housing, similarly nonprofit developers create and build affordable housing and then manage it. So we actually specialize in supportive and affordable housing, which uh, is generally a mix of people who are formerly homeless and have ongoing special needs in order to maintain their homes. Uh, and so we provide 24-hour security, on-site case management services for those folks. And then the rest of the apartments, the 40% of apartments, are for a mix of low-income tenants who don't necessarily have special needs and are uh, able to get into that housing through a lottery. Um, we also run homeless shelters and transitional housing programs for people who have special needs and who are living in a variety of apartments in the community. So there's, there's a host of different ways that my work intersects with affordable housing, and I'm happy to talk about some ideas that we have about how, ways that information and data can help make our jobs a little better and easier. All right, uh, thanks for having me. My name is Moses Gates. I work for the Regional Plan Association. Uh, I'm gonna apologize in advance. I'm gonna have to go like about 10 minutes early uh, before two. Uh, so I started in affordable housing as kind of a working for a small neighborhood-based nonprofit development uh, organization called St. Nick's Alliance in East Williamsburg. And from there, I went to the Association for Neighborhood Housing Development, which is kind of a citywide affordable housing advocacy organization. And about five months ago, I started working for the Regional Plan Association, which is a uh, a New York metro region-wide based organization that tries to advocate for uh, good development. And we're coming out of our, with our fourth plan recommendations, fourth regional plan recommendations uh, next year. And to give you an idea of geography, it's essentially, our region is essentially everywhere commuter rail goes. It's Trenton to Poughkeepsie to Montauk to Bridgeport. Uh, you know, half of Connecticut, half of Jersey, Hudson Valley, Long Island, and that's kind of what we're what we're charged with planning. Uh, as I've kind of moved from a neighborhood to a citywide to a region-wide basis, it's been really interesting to see how the different the affordable housing conversations and debates are at each geography and how the solutions looked at are different and how a lot of times those solutions are in conflict and how a lot of times uh, you know, something that would be good for affordable housing in one neighborhood doesn't benefit the region and vice versa. And one of the things I've learned in, you know, housing and development over the years is kind of everything is a balancing act. And there, there are very few win-win scenarios. There's only prioritization in trying to figure out, uh, you know, what kind of, of how, where, what kind, what amount, uh, kind of housing, you know, you can incentivize and you can help with. And that's, uh, it, it, it's a sad but but very true thing is that you know there are a lot of trade-offs in the affordable housing world uh, and there's a lot of kind of very hard math that goes along with trying to make things happen and you know solutions that that come out of it or you know never make everyone happy um, so I would love to kind of get more in depth about what those what those are and how uh, you know how the community, the hacker community. I don't know if I got that got that right. Uh, um, I'm a bit old. Uh, how, how you guys can help with some of the data analysis that is, you know, if you think New York City is tough, try to you know going to do some of these data, you know, getting the data to work in Sullivan County, New York, or somewhere like that. It's it's much harder. So uh, all your help would make all of our work easier and. Be, be great to get going. Hi everyone, um, my name is Emily Goldman and um, thank you for being here. Um, so I um, am currently finishing my PhD right now in city and regional planning <coughs> up at Cornell um, in Ithaca, but um, most of my understanding of affordable housing and housing issues in general um, relate to Brooklyn from my research that I conducted um, for about a year um, from in 2014. So um, historic preservation, um, which is actually my background. Oh, yeah, I think I to mention that. So um, I worked for the Landmarks Commission for four years, the city's Landmarks Commission, for four years before I, um, before I started this uh, degree that I'm in. And um, historic preservation and housing and affordable housing actually have 
quite an interesting and an important relationship. Um, but I don't think I'm really going to get into that so much today. Um, but it is a topic that um, that there is a lot to dis to discuss. Um, well, for instance, so historic preservation does tend to reduce the amount of <coughs> new development in areas that are regulated by the city's landmarks commission because they are kept in their architectural fabric. Um, and uh, many people, housing advocates say, you know, we need more housing, you hear that everywhere, but you can't build a lot of new construction in these designated areas, um, of which there are now a lot in the city, 25% of Manhattan and 4% of the city in total. Um, and so this, there's this tension there about, you know, we need more housing, but we can't put it in these areas. And um, that's an interesting topic uh, for probably another discussion. But um, anyway, so my research in historic preservation led me to Central Brooklyn, um, where I was researching the historic preservation efforts that were going on there. Um, 17 new historic districts were created in Brooklyn between 2007 and 2015, which doubled the borough's total number and um, basically was a huge spike in a very short period of time. And I wanted to understand the community's goals for that precisely, um, but while I was there, I came um, into um, the remarkable and robust affordable housing movement going on in central Brooklyn, um, led by some organizations like the Crown Heights Tenants Union. And um, since I was there and had the opportunity to, I um, you know, just attended and participated to the extent that I could in as many of those events as possible to really get a better understanding of what was happening um, in this regard to tenants. and. Um, Basically, you know, their work is so important in terms of creating a community for people who are experiencing the pressures of not being able to potentially stay in their rent-stabilized unit. Um, so, as Caitlin mentioned, um, it may represent the bear of New York City's affordable housing right now, but it's also the, a place where there's a lot of pressure to get these units out of rent stabilization so that, um, so that landlords can charge market rate. And in areas that are becoming increasingly hot and desirable, well, uh, that pressure becomes even more because landlords' prices are rising as well. Um, and um, you know, so we have to maybe, you know, we do want to acknowledge that. Um, but anyway, so tenants are experiencing, um, you know, uh, in intimidation tactics and other kinds of things, you know, from some landlords, not all of them, but, um, and this is a big, you know, a big problem uh, in terms of this issue of deregulation, as it's called. So, of deregulation of the rent stabilized units, and um, that's the area that I feel most familiar with in terms of the affordable housing conversation, having witnessed a lot of, um, you know, real human stories about what was going on um, in their own personal lives, and um, yeah, that's maybe what we'll end up speaking to a little bit more throughout this conversation. Hi, I'm John Krauss. Uh, I didn't, I was too lazy about my title for the panel, so I'm sorry about that. I'm the data curator at Cardo, which is a location intelligence company, um, and in general, a really good way to uh, generate maps based off of data sets you might have, as well as do analysis on them and SQL, <coughs> that sort of thing. Um, I'm coming here today more as kind of interested party. Um, I've been kind of doing small projects based off of housing, and affordable housing in particular, and New York City data for five, four years, I can't quite remember. Um, I, I worked at the Furman Center for some time uh, on a project that's actually quite relevant to this discussion, which was an attempt to um, basically create a map of the entire world of uh, privately held uh, subsidized housing in New York City, which is kind of a smorgasbord of different programs, none of which actually include stabilization, uh, because strangely enough, stabilization isn't quite technically an affordable program. It has affordable components, but it's not per se an affordability program. Um, because people have been making a lot of mention of stabilization tonight, and it's a particular interest, uh, not tonight, today. Um, <laughs> um, and it's a particular interest of mine. Um, I know that it's, it's not necessarily super well known what stabilization is. Um, it's a rent control program, although it's not rent control because rent control is a different program, um, but a, a, a price control system for uh, tenants in New York City uh, and a couple other parts of New York State. It's actually administered by the state, not the city, which makes things a lot more fun. Um, 
And what rent stabilization does is for apartments that are in the program, not the tenants, but for the apartments in the program, and whoever happens to rent that apartment, it limits the increase um, uh, in rent to a certain percentage set by a board <laughs> controlled by the city and the state jointly. Um, I think, or is it just the city? Both, Both? okay, cool. Um, so there's a kind of a limited percentage increase that can happen between lease renewals for tenants. Um, the very sad thing about the program is that, in my opinion, I think many other people would agree, it's been designed to fail. It's been designed to fail affordability. It's been designed to fail tenants. Um, and it's essentially incentivized landlords to uh, move tenants out of their apartments in order to gain the benefit of rent increases, which are greater when there's a change in tenancy. Uh, and at a certain point, um, basically when the last decade, um, the apartment simply exits the program and no longer is stabilized at all. And that's over, nobody really knows how many stabilized units there are, which is another thing we should talk about today, uh, but on the order of 800,000 uh, in the city. So a lot of apartments are stabilized. Um, and so my particular connection to stabilization is that I wrote with in collaboration with some other people, I wrote some code to extract the number of stabilized units in every building in New York City, um, which wasn't information that was kind of collected before. Uh, it was hidden in plain sight on tax bills, uh, which are published by the New York City Department of Finance one by one as a PDF. Um, so to uh, figure out how many stabilized units there actually are, and not only in the present, but going back to 2007 year by year, um, it, it was necessary to download every tax bill and figure out what the format of it was and pull out the relevant numbers, which resulted in a lot of other information, actually about tax incentives in 421A, which is super relevant. Um, so yeah, that data is all online, um, and it's a resource that I definitely suggest anyone who's interested in affordability, either from the stabilization perspective or from 421A, J51, or this kind of alphabet soup soup of other programs that suggest that everyone take a look at it. Um, yeah. Cool, so uh, let's let's get a lay of the land in terms of the data that's already out a lot with all of the data. Yeah. Um, so what's kind of the data sources that are out there and then like what are what are the obstacles to collecting more data? Oh, I have some notes on my computer, I'll see how. For affordability, um, there, there are very scattered data sources. Um, I mean, for buildings in general, if you, with building data in New York, with probably, you can get um, the information about, say, where buildings are, what their footprints are, all that information from the Department of City Planning in um, data sets called Pluto and Map Pluto. Um, if you're working with data, I think it's really important to point out that buildings aren't parcels, um, and parcels have identifiers. So parcels are basically what's taxed. Uh, buildings exist on parcels. Buildings are a separate thing. You can have many buildings in one parcel. Um, and it's important to kind of have some of this vocabulary because uh, when you begin to work with affordable housing data sets, you're gonna be confronted with this kind of world of terms that um, refer to other things. Um, and it's if you do relational databases, you'll kind of understand immediately um, everything is kind of related along certain identifying factors. Um, so BBL, for example, borough block lot, is the parcel identifier. Um, if you're trying to figure out, say, who owns what buildings or how much money someone is collecting from the government, um, you're gonna need to kind of use parcels as a way of connecting together um, different uh, parties. Um, so the Department of City Planning puts out Pluto and Map Pluto, which will give you things like BBL and where buildings are, and a little bit of information about ownership. Um, the Department of Finance puts out transactional data, which means the sales of properties and uh, mortgages for the whole city going back to 1966, and a data set called ACRIS. Um, and these are both open data sets. You can look for them on the Open Data Portal, and you'll be able to download them if you wait long enough. Um, and that is actually a pretty good resource for beginning to get into some of the affordable data. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different agencies that do affordability. Um, so it's important to kind of be aware of those if you're beginning to do searches to try and find data. Um, so HCR, Homes and Community Renewal, is the um, agency that handles stabilization. Uh, and is, it's a state agency. Um, 
And they put out a little bit of information, but not very much on their website. So I would plug my own scraping project as a way to get stabilization data probably better than you can get from them. But they do put out lists of what buildings are stabilized and what buildings aren't as an Excel spreadsheet. And they delete the old ones when they put up the new ones. So you can FOIL them and maybe have some luck, I don't know. Uh, the Department of Finance, uh, like I said, has the transaction data. So if you want to know who bought a building or who sold a building or who mortgaged a building to whom, which can be very important um, to understand kind of networks of connection um, or who's actually behind some project. Um, that's the ACRIS data set, and that's all by BBL. Um, HPD is another city agency, Housing Preservation and Development. Um, they actually do of most, I would say, of the affordability, I mean, they do all the affordability stuff at the city level, um, so they administer a variety of different programs and actually um, are the ones who are supposed to, I think, keep track of um, 4211A and like who actually, like what affordability came out of certain tax breaks. Um, so they have, and they also put out RFPs and such to encourage developers to build affordable housing. Um, they're basically the agency that interacts with developers to encourage affordability in New York City. Um, they also administer HDFCs, which are an odd affordability program that's actually PD is pretty good. They've gotten a lot better in the last couple of years about putting out data. Um, the tricky thing is portal, but you're better off looking at their actual data page on their website because um, they have more archival and historical information there, which can be really useful for figuring out how things have changed in the last few <coughs> years. So you can get information going back, I think, at least five or six years going on their website. On the open data portal, I think you only have kind of the most recent information. It's also important to note um, HPD is the point of contact agency for tenants who have complaints about their landlords. Um, so if you file a complaint about um, a broken faucet or peeling paint or something like that with 311, the agency that receives that is going to be HPD and they're the kind of enforcement arm. They have inspectors, they go out and take a look at bad conditions. So in cases where, um, you know, if your interest in affordability is, is harassment, for example, um, HPD is a good place to look for violations of complaints. And that's all open data as well. You can get that on the open data portal and you can get archival versions of it going back. Um, another really important city agency for data is the Department of Buildings, which um, doesn't deal with tenant complaints per se, but um, has a lot of information about renovations. So when people file um, to do work on an apartment, they actually have to go to DOB if they're doing it on the level um, and say what work they're doing, who their contractors are. Like a fire hose of data actually um, from DOB, but I know that um, someone named Ziggy has put together some information, basically some scripts that can cobble together the historical data sets that DOB puts up if you're interested in that. Um, another important thing to note about HP data, HPD data is um, multi larger, I think all multifamily buildings are supposed to register with HPD, um, which means that. They publish registration information. Um, that would include the registered agent of a building, and that can be another good way to kind of connect together different owners based off of uh, a shared party. So yeah, HPD, DOF, DOB, HCR, what am I missing? Lots of alphabets here. Yeah. Um, I'll, uh, I'll add a few other data sources, um, some of which are kind of untapped. Uh, so if you're doing building by building data, um, those are like everything that was mentioned is good, but there's also a lot of good survey data out there. Uh, you know, HPD in conjunction with the Department of Census does every three years a housing and vacancy survey that asks a lot of things you're not going to find in the census that are a little more relevant to New York City. That's a wonderful data source and they have all of those online. Uh, dating back, I think, to 1999. Uh, the Rank Guidelines Board does a lot of great research, and they do it every year to you know, get inform their rent increases. And that's all, uh, it's all survey data, but it's a kind of another wonderful data source. And the, uh, you know, I would- It's all available online? Yeah, they're, they're in various forms are all available online. And also um, HVS, um, I know people have done some work to basically publish that as a CSV, which is a little easier to work with yep. than the format they use. Um, RGB reports are all PDFs, though, which is yeah. a little tricky. Um, 
And then I would be remiss if I did not not mention the Furman Center, or at least oh, uh, yeah. to mention the Furman Center, uh, which kind of is, doesn't do that much original research, but does a wonderful job of kind of publicizing all of the survey data out there. The place that is a very untapped source for very good data is the New York State Court System. Uh, the New York State Court System is starting to get its act together in terms of data availability, you know, not on a case-by-case -case basis on, you know, involving Excel and programs like that. Um, but they will, they keep track of every housing court judgment. Uh, those are eviction proceedings, eviction judgments, cases brought against landlords. Uh, and one kind of area of research that's really ramping up is around evictions and you know what drives them, where they take place, how many are commenced versus brought, uh, you know how many moves are not officially evictions but essentially uh, you know non-official evictions, um, and that's something that you know you're start going to start to see a lot of research around, and it's going to heavily involve the state court system, and uh, you know I. We've asked for a lot of this data, and you know I think that the uh, the attitude is one of you know general government uh, slowness, not one of intentional uh, destruction. But it's still going to take a while, and going to I think you know more and more, more and more people try to work with them. I think the more systems they'll put in place to make it easier to access their data. Yeah, that's interesting. That's actually the, the same thing that I was going to note. And the only other city source that I would note is just the Department of Homeless Services. So mm -hmm. again, if we're thinking broadly about affordability, there are 62,000 people sleeping in shelters last night. Right? There's a long wealth of information about people, uh, where they were living before they entered shelter, and then where they moved to out of shelter, both of which are really critical if you want to kind of solve the bigger picture. Um, and one of the things I'll note just on the housing court data, um, you know, while there's well, while there's definitely lags, um, one of the things that the Department of Homeless Services did a couple of years ago uh, was work with an application called Arachno and create uh, basically just a map that combined housing court data and, and placements out of shelter, um, which we as a homeless prevention provider have actually been using to target our outreach and services, right? Because we know that people who uh, have been in shelter before are at high risk of returning to shelter, and we know, you know, with a flag or so, um, where there are high levels of evictions. And so we actually have a um, a mobile homelessness outreach van, the UCAN van, um, that we have been using in communities actually to target even as specifically as buildings where we know that there have been a, lot, you know, a high number of eviction proceedings uh, filed in recent months and are basically parking out front and trying to figure out who needs help. Um, and that model of, of figuring out how we could better use this kind of data um, in, and especially with less lag time, and especially if we can get it, figure out a way to get it faster or closer to real time, to target services um, is huge. Because we have resources that are available, there's just not enough, right? And so if we can really target it to the people who are at greatest risk of losing an affordable unit and then getting and ending up in shelter, that is, it's certainly been, I think, a high priority of this administration in terms of where they're putting service dollars. Um, but making it more efficient would you know, obviously take those same dollars and stretch them out further. So there's, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I think um, the, the final part of your question was um, holes, kind of, yeah. um, like what is there not? Um, and I think to, to um, their points, um, there's a there's a lag time generally between uh, what's happening right now and what is in the data, and it's especially painful actually with uh, rental pricing information. So figuring out where rent has increased a lot recently is very very hard to tell. Um, figuring out even what people pay for rent is really really difficult. Um, the housing and vacancy survey um, is one way to get that, and it's very nice because it's broken down by different programs. So you'll get uh, median rent. On the market, you'll get median rent uh, for rent stabilized. You'll get median rent for these other programs, which can be very useful. Um, but it's once every three years, and the most recent one was 2014. Um, the American Community Survey, which is uh, published annually by the Census Bureau, is also a really, really good source for um, rent people pay. And unlike uh, the HVS, which is pretty much done by the approximately community board, 
um, the American Community Survey goes down to uh, block group level, so you get almost down to the block. Um, but that's averaged out over a long period of time, and the most recent release, again, is 2014, an average, actually, of 2010 to 2014. Um, so to actually figure out how much people are paying right now or how much people's rent has increased in the last two years in a, in a small area is very, very difficult. Um, and I think unfortunate because the state actually does have a lot of this data because of registrations. Um, but they don't publish that, or they don't even publish an aggregate version of it. So I was just going to kind of follow up uh, along similar lines. And this map that you're talking about, Caitlin, uh, what is, what is kind of like the, the stopping point? Or like, what's the impediment to having the real-time data? That's a good question that I'm not 100% sure I know the answer to. Okay. Um, I mean, I, as far as I can tell, the, the number one impediment is just actually you know, the court system is an entirely paper-driven mm -hmm. system, right? And so there is somebody who is typing that information into a computer, right? And I think that's basically where the lag lies. I think the other challenge is having the resources within government to keep these things updated and, and make it a priority. Right? So, you know, we had, and I think that this often happens with projects, right? It's, it's, it's as up-to-date as it can be at a certain point of time, but then if the resources aren't there to keep it up-to-date and there's somebody on the other end kind of knocking on the door, you sure it's just, yeah. you know, it gets deprioritized and it is, it's the line of time start to stretch out a little bit. I mean, the, the challenge with government is always shifting their mentality from a case-by-case -case data system and source to a system data system and source. Um, lots of, you know, the courts in HPD for a long time were very, very good about meticulously keeping track of individual deals and individual cases and were generally very open about it. You know, you can go to HPD and ask them for the history of one building in the deal, or you can go on Acris and they have all the information, but nobody had ever thought of taking this and make, starting to make data sets out of it until you know you get to kind of modern times, and that transition is is difficult for institutions that you know are large and have inertia uh, and otherwise you know are are big systems, and I think just kind of overall, you know, anytime you can you have a case by case data you can start to ask the agencies and the government agencies for it on a systematic basis and start them thinking about it in kind of a big systems data way, um, you know, you start to change the way they think and the way they, they input this kind of stuff. I mean, the Pluto data is a wonderful example. The Pluto data was kind of kept originally so you could look up an individual building and figure out the zoning and what you could do with it and all like that. And after enough people figured out, hey, the city has all this, and started asking for it, you know, the city started looking at, oh, we're going to make it into a giant downloadable data set, make it compatible with uh, GIS programs, put it online, um, and now it's, it's an incredible resource. Um, so starting kind of that rethinking process with other agencies is something I would always tell people to keep in mind. I think one of the other challenges, and it was not so much one of the challenges with housing court data, although it's relevant, is that um, you know there are um, ownership structures for particular buildings are not always very clear, right? It, it, intentionally so. So you know, one of the things John and I worked on together at the Furman Center uh, was this subsidized housing information project, which I think is a great starting point uh, and is available on the um, the Furman Center's website. But one of the things that we were never able to push beyond is you know, the owner that's listed on that site is whatever corporation is listed on the tax records, right? And so, and so connecting that corporation that's listed on the tax records, which is usually the name of the building, right, to an actual individual or company that operates, or that owns that building, and then a management company that operates that building that has a lot of value. Um, that has a lot of value for real people who are looking for apartments, right? So like one of the things that would be great to exist in the world is some way of matching something like the you know, public advocate puts out the like 50 worst landlords list every year, right? But you would never know if you're looking on Craigslist for an apartment whether your building is, happens to be owned by one of those 50 worst landlords. Sure. And finding that out would be really tricky. 
them. And, and so figuring out ways to connect information that is available if you dig hard enough at an individual level on a systematic level could be really helpful. I mean, it helps even organizations like ours that are helping to place people into housing, and we don't want to place people into disastrous housing, right? But you know, the only way you know if there's been a bunch of violations on a particular building is to look at that particular building, right? There's no easy, clean way to like sort out <laughs> you know, available apartments and say, oh, these are disastrous, let's get them. Right, so this is what John was kind of talking about earlier in terms of there's actually a lot of different data sources, but it's hard to connect uh, between them in terms of understanding that. Yeah, I mean, if to do a kind of deep dive on it, you'd want to take three or four different data sets, a combination of state, city, state and city levels mostly, to try and make that connection. And what's funky also is that connection could be very valuable, even if it doesn't get you to the, the name that people would know of that landlord because there's just so many different registrations where there's the possibility of sharing an address or an agent in a meaningful way that still won't connect you to, I don't know, this is this landlord who's infamous. Um, but because those buildings might also be connected to a lot of complaints or violations, it's still, you could still, for example, flag things in a way that would be relatively automated, and you could always use the power of, of Google upon like finding some particular collection of properties to try and do the, the legwork to figure out who would really own those. All right, and my last question, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Uh, if, we, if we fast forwarded five years and we did have this kind of really nice system where everything was easily discoverable and easily connected, how, how much would that help you? How much would that help your research and your efforts uh, going forward? I mean, I this is an open that. question to yeah. anyone on the panel. <laughs> um, I mean, I think obviously the, the question mark is what do we mean by everything? I, mean, I think that there, for the kind of work that Canva does, there's um, client-driven work that could be better informed by real-time, easy to access information. And one of the big things that we're trying to do is connect real individuals to apartments that are safe and affordable that they can live in, and there's very few of them. So you, know, the, you want the best information, <laughs> exactly, and you want to be able to act on it as quickly as possible. Um, as a, putting on a slightly different hat, as a nonprofit developer, and another one of the motivations for this uh, data piece that the Furman Center created a number of years ago, um, there's a different kind of information asymmetry and, and much more dramatic asymmetry in straight, straight financing between nonprofit developers that are looking for sites to build affordable housing or to you know, rehab buildings and create affordable housing uh, and for profit developers that are looking for those same little pieces of land um, and anything that could give an advantage to those nonprofits that can't walk in with a briefcase full of cash, right? Uh, would, could be a, a huge advantage. I mean, I, it, w it would help a lot. There are real concerns about individual privacy data that you know you, you have to be very realistic about. I mean, the court system is reluctant to give you the addresses of people who have been evicted, and that's not a you know an unfounded thing. Um, I would say that kind of whenever we do this research, housing folks are always coming across questions that new questions. So one of you know, one of the hottest topics is how much does gentrification affect involuntary displacement? Uh, and you can measure gentrification through, you know, increases in rents and things like that. There is no way to measure what is a voluntary versus an involuntary move in our data sets. It's nothing that's asked on the American Community Survey. It's nothing anybody even thought of until now to start to study. Um, so it's the kind of thing where I could say, you know, yes, all this data would be wonderful and we would get it and there would just be more questions and more, more things to know. And lots of it is kind of individual survey-based data, not anything you can really do that well in kind of an automated way. Um, I will actually say one more potential data source out there, which would be great, is I used to work in HPD's marketing department 14 years ago. Uh, and we asked a question on anybody who submitted an application for any affordable housing project, what is the reason for your move? Uh, and at the time, it, it wasn't anything we thought of to do any data with, you know? Now that reasons for, for displacement and reasons for move is something everybody wants to study, I desperately wish we had typed that into Excel instead of sticking the paper files in the basement, we would have 
a database of thousands of New Yorkers geocoded by address uh, and the reason, their reasons for wanting to move, um, which, which would inform a, a great deal of academic work going on right now. Um, so that data source is still out there. You know, everybody fills out the application online now for the HPD affordable housing programs. Um, and I actually don't know if the agency is doing things with that in terms of trying to aggregate the data and figure things out, but I wouldn't be surprised if they were. Um, and that is an incredible source of individual survey data um, that nobody has ever really tapped. Just to make a quick note on that, um, FOIL is a very good tool in uh, the state of New York to ask agencies for data. Um, so you could file a request for free with HPD and ask for survey responses like that. They might say yes, they might say no, but it doesn't cost anything to ask. So for those of you unfamiliar, FOIL is the New York version of FOIA, which is the Freedom of Information Act and Laws, the New York City's version of Freedom of Information. All right. Um, yeah, and uh, along the lines of this sort of more people-oriented, well, you know, very qualitative people-oriented data that um, Moses just spoke to, there was a great project that came out of this civic tech community about a year ago called HeatSeek. Uh, I think that's what it's called. And um, <coughs> HeatSeek is, is, an, is a project that enables um, tenants who are experiencing um, lack of heat in their apartment, which has been associated with some of these, you know, in scrupulous ways that sometimes landlords are promoting the eviction of people, basically, um, and uh, by turning off their heat in the wintertime. So um, basically, uh, this project, the goal of this project was to enable tenants who are experiencing this to log this complaint um, in a, you know, in an official way to give them a way to express that information to someone else other than maybe their neighbor or 311 is another way that they, um, that they do do this and community groups in Brooklyn are absolutely promoting the use of 311 to their members and their community residents to say, you know, use it because then it's documented and people can then do stuff with this. Um, so HeatSeek was another app that was specifically geared for this heat issue. Um, and that was a really great project that came out of this community um, and the kind of kind of innovative things that can be done, I think. Um, so, yeah, that's the thing I wanted to mention. Cool. Um, so I definitely have lots more questions, but uh, are there any questions out in the audience? For um, actually, I wanted to uh, continue from your point, Caitlin, um, about, I guess, um, the incentives or lack thereof for nonprofit developers, because I'd actually like noted this question earlier, but I kind of wanted to get a sense of um, what commitment, if any, that the Blasio administration has made to change the ratio of the new developments that are built by nonprofit versus for-profit developers, and what kind of progress you see on that front with, with new incentives or opportunities for nonprofit developers. That's a great question. So, uh, yeah, so, 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 just so everybody can hear, this question was around whether the Devasio administration has made a specific commitment around increasing uh, the share of affordable housing that's produced by nonprofit versus for profit developers. Um, so, I think that um, the, the mayor's housing plan, at least in my characterization of it, and please you go look at it yourself in case I'm incorrect. Um, but I think that it's fairly agnostic as to the type of developer the mayor has committed to. 200,000 units of um, affordable housing being preserved or built. Uh, that mantra I've heard many, many times. Um, but I, I think that you know there are for-profit and non-profit developers of affordable housing. Uh, either one are welcomed when they have that ambitious goal um, of affordable housing. Um, and I think so. We, you know, where, where I'm talking about the issues related to land acquisition. Um, and certainly, as, a, as an affordable housing developer, we are competing with for-profit affordable housing developers, and we are competing with for-profit market rate and luxury de developers, right? It's all pieces of land. <laughs> um, and so the, the major challenge, of course, is that in any trend, in any real estate transaction, um, you know, knowing about, knowing that this is going to be available for sale, uh, and being able to pay for it quickly <laughs> are huge advantages. Um, and for nonprofits, and we are at, at the very bottom of being able to do that uh, because not only do we not have huge cash reserves that we can you know, put up as a deposit, 
Um, we the, the subsidy programs that we use to actually build affordable housing limit us to paying the appraised value. So in these heating up markets where the for-profit developers who are building luxury are willing to pay higher than the appraised value, they don't have those same strengths. Mm -hmm. and that becomes a problem. Uh, and this is, you know, kind of goes back to the lags and in information, right? What, what is an appraiser looking at? <laughs> well, they're looking at old information. And so when things are heating up fast, it's the same thing in the just general, you know, uh, real estate market for single family or for uh, co-ops and condos. Um, you run into that same challenge where when there's a lot of cash purchases, the prices go up faster than the appraisals. Um, will kind of allow them to, right? Meaning that there's an advantage to people who can make cash. So, so I, I spent literally years fighting this fight to the point where, like, you know, I probably still make, like, Vicky Bean's head spin if I would to talk about this. But, uh, you know, it is the value of nonprofits over for-profits is something that is a debate within government and a debate within the affordable housing community. And many people, not me, uh, look at it as an affordable housing transaction is essentially a bilateral contract between a developer and the government. Uh, the government gives some type of subsidy in return for some type of affordability, and that is governed by a, a enforceable contract between the two parties. Uh, and many people think that that is the sufficient guarantee of good management and affordability uh, and that it doesn't matter who the developer is, if they're profit motivated or not profit motivated, because you have that agreement, and that agreement's gonna be the same no matter who the developer is. And that's a, I, I would say, a reasonably common philosophy in government and the affordable housing world. Other folks, myself included, think nonprofits kind of bring a special value above and beyond that, uh, in terms of, you know, you're not looking for the loopholes to make money, you're looking for the loopholes to preserve affordability. Um, and you know, think that there should be more incentive for that. Um, when it comes to private sites, I mean, it, Caitlin explained it best. It's you, you know, when you don't have control of the land, you do what you can and you work with who you can to make the best deal you can, and that's kind of how it goes. Um, if the government owns the land, though, uh, you know, then they have the ability to set a lot more terms of you know, not just the affordability, but also the ownership of the land, and that's where. You know, they would be able, if the government has the land, to say we're going to work with nonprofits on our government-owned land or community land trusts, or you know, we have that ability to not have to work with whoever can do it quick and cheap. We can actually structure what we want to see out of this development. Uh, Jordan, uh, sort of somewhat new to this civic tech world, uh, kind of more business like pure business, business, for profit, MBA stuff. Um, but I'm super interested in these topics of like land use. Um, housing is obviously one of the big uses, big uses we have. But it, it struck me that um, like the conversation uh, really revolved around like non-market solutions, kind of as it tends to do in, in the civic uh, space. Um, so things like gentrification, like, you know, artificially restraining prices, um, avoiding evictions, which like are very worthy topics. Um, I think, I forget your name, but you had, you had talked a little bit at the beginning about like one of the questions being like, like uh, historic preservation being something that is, is for example a trade off where it may limit new construction and therefore like market solutions. And so I was, I guess I was hoping that there, and wondering maybe you guys could talk to some of the more, um, like the conversation about like, there's this other school of thought, which is that, you know, the problem that, the reason that there's no affordable housing is because the number of just pure housing units, not affordable versus not affordable, but the number of affordable housing units being built in New York City or like for really extreme, extreme example, we can all say, like, I think pretty much almost everybody agrees that San Francisco needs like just more housing, right? Um, is, is much, much lower, right? Um, I mean, I could like, say some statistics, you know, like if you were like Edward Glazer, or, like trying to the city kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, there are, I mean, one of the issues may be that we're trying to talk about data. And so, like, it's obviously a lot easier to get data on existing buildings mm -hmm. than data on, like, theoretical buildings. Yeah. Um, so I think that makes a really big difference. But then, like, you do have these economists like Edward Glazer doing these studies to sort of compare cost of construction, which can be measured, 
to a cost of housing and showing that, for example, overall in the United States, there is a certain profit margin on housing that exists of at over what it costs to construct something versus sell it. That, and then you can sort of see how that's distorted in, um, in certain sort of high desirability, but also sort of like markets where the number of new units is being really constrained by zoning, historical preservation, et cetera. I don't know. There's a lot, I just put a lot out there, like are there data sets? Like, what do you guys think of that? But I'd love to just kind of hear some conversation about that, that side of things. I, I, I will try to start. Um, this is what I do every day, and I don't want to talk for half an hour about it. Um, I, I would say it's kind of a both and thing, and that you know, at the end of the day, and, and, and as I've started working in a wider and wider geography, I've started to believe this more and more that it is there is a fundamental supply demand balance that you must address. Um, and that you know we are short on the demands or on the supply side, and that we do have to incentivize housing and construction. Um, lots of times, or do we have to incentivize it, or just like not prevent it? Like there's a lot of incentive. Already. By incentivize, I mean change government policy right. to encourage okay. building more housing. Um, there is a lot of times people like the conversation to end right there, and then just say, okay, great, building is always good. Let's done, the, you know, the problem is solved, the solution is here, let's go. And I, I, I don't believe that. I think we need to have a lot more nuanced thought um, on two levels. The first level is to make sure what is constructed is effective. Um, if you build 100,000 square feet of housing, you can make that 10 gigantic apartments, or you can make that 100 small apartments, or 1,000 very small apartments. You know, you, you can change tax policy, building code policy, all sorts of policy uh, to not just say building is good, but building what will create the most effective supply is good. And I think that needs to be a lot more a, a lot larger conversation. Um, the other part is oftentimes there's a mismatch between <coughs> the region-wide good, which is to create more housing, and the neighborhood good. And you run into a real, a very real prisoner's dilemma which is local communities oftentimes don't like more housing, some, some because of fear of driving prices, some because of fear of more people and overwhelming social services, others for many other reasons, but that is a paradigm that is found in 95% of communities in the region, is all things being equal, they would like no more housing. Um, and so you have that neighborhood bad that's contrasted with the region-wide good. Um, and the conversation becomes one of policy priorities, which is if you are going to build more housing, and I believe that that is a vital piece of the puzzle, now you are talking about where and which communities are going to bear the negative brunt of that creation. I don't, I, I should clarify, I don't necessarily believe additional housing is a negative brunt on a community. I think that a lot of times it's wonderful. Um, you know, it brings more commercial services, it brings, you know, more density, more eyes on the street. I think it's an urban planning good, but, you know, that is not how many local community boards see it. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the conversation that's taking place right now is if you are going to incentivize development, where geographically is that going to go and what kind of communities is it going to go in? Uh, and I, I, I have many, many, many thoughts on that, but I will, I will leave them uh, to so that, those were great points, and also what the housing would look like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the NYCHA projects that were built in the mid 20th century as being, you know, not the most humane environments necessarily. Um, and um, so, if we are going to build more housing, you know, well, first of all, who's going to do that? Is it going to be government like NYCHA? As, you know, would, would we ever revitalize that? There was a moratorium placed on creation of public housing in 1974 that hasn't been reversed as far as I know. Um, so uh, is the government ever going to step up and provide housing again or is it always going to be in the private market? Um, and if so, still, what's it going to look like? You know, that's a big, a big, big question. Um, there's a famous example of another uh, public housing project in St. Louis that uh, was demolished 18 years after having been built um, because it was kind of known to being sort of creating a, a very inhumane environment for the residents. You know, it's obviously a complicated story, but um, so 
you know, whereas, like in the 1930s, there was a big housing movement about creating all these low-rise neighborhoods um, where the housing, the, the neighborhood, the, the community around affordable housing was a much more humane environment. So like you have places that still exist, like Sunnyside Gardens in, in Queens, which is a, a, a remnant of that era, and also a place called Hillside Homes in the Bronx, which is another. Um, so there are these great models, but it's harder to, you know, it's, it takes so many people involved, from architects to, to developers, to money, to everything, um, to, you know. So anyway, yeah, that's, so, so the, the kind of housing that's created, I think, is also another huge question. And can we create new low-rise housing, and how can we do that? Because you can't build, if you can't get as many units, then it's harder to, it's harder to fund that kind of project, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, that would be like another, you know, big question about the idea of a lot of new housing. Um, but like, friends, I'll just mention that um, I know some people who work for this um, institute called the uh, Institute of Public Architecture, IPA, in New York City. And they, they do great work and they have an idea right now that they're working on about creating new housing specifically in manufacturing zones, um, uh, which is going to be kind of like unconventional housing style, like someone here was referring to, um, where uh, the units would be for, you know, probably tailored more to young artist types, maybe moving into in areas who don't necessarily need to, a two-bedroom apartment or something like this. They can share kitchens and more like a co-living type of space, particularly for manufacturing zones, um, where the resident, the amount of residential housing is pro prohibited by, by the zoning laws. So, um, you know, there's some innovative work like that going on um, in terms of, you know, keeping the city's fabric as it is and keeping the, you know, the, the different uses of land going um, and at the same time providing housing in a maybe in a slightly inventive way considering our changes in society and stuff like that. So, yeah, those are just some other, like, big things to throw into um, the mix of the complicated issue of new housing, I would say, and people are doing about it. Just to add one other thing on this, sort of, I mean, I think that there's great research questions in the question of, okay, so it, it is clear, right? We, I mean, we've had a, a we've been in a housing crisis for 40 years, right? The, the demand, I mean, I mean, just technically, the red, the red guidelines board um, only will continue to operate as long as we have a, the, the, the housing vacancy has been below 5% in New York City for four years. So we, we're very tight market. There's a clear, there's no question that the demand for housing overall is higher than the supply, right? Like we, we so rarely are at a point that there's anything stays vacant. But what I think is really interesting in terms of construction and that I, I would love to see some research on, and actually some data does exist for, um, you know, one of the other things that the, the Furman Center had, had done with John and I were both there, um, is to look at the total, um, and the floor area ratio, right, basically the capacity of, of any given site, right, and to look at where there was unused capacity, essentially the air rights concept, right? Um, and, and it's very interesting because in any given neighborhood, you know, you, you sort of think like, okay, well, zoning is keeping more housing from going here, right? But it, it actually, there are many, many, right now, <laughs> there are hundreds of thousands of lots in New York City where you could build on top of them. The, the existing zoning would allow you to go ahead and do that. Of course, the reality of a, of a house or a building sitting there right now is prohibitive, right? And so it, there's demolition costs, there's the challenge of building on top of an existing uh, building. But those costs, I think, are a combination. I mean, I'm sure there's probably some permitting and, and other kinds of there's issues. Community board. Other community board issues. Well, not if your building has a right, right? I mean, people might be mad at you, okay? <laughs> but that doesn't mean they can prevent it, right? So I think that's kind of an interesting area to explore. I think the other thing that I'd be really interested in is, you know, while you would think that seeing more dense housing in a given neighborhood would be a sign that the average prices in those neighborhoods should go down, right? If you're going from like, a bunch of you know 30 unit buildings to a whole bunch of like 150 unit buildings like okay well then we should be seeing a reduction in total you know the average cost for that neighborhood but certainly i think you know i think of like crown heights right or prospect Lovers gardens where there actually are a number of neighborhoods where in fact you can build as of right people hadn't done it for years and then all of a sudden developers said you know i think that this could support a 20-story building i'm going to go ahead and build one right and 
certainly the community it, it believes that this will increase prices for their neighborhood as, as opposed to decrease them. And I think that there's a lot of reasons to think that, right? They're building, the housing that will be built there is going to be a higher average cost and the, likely the amenities that will begin to arrive in those neighborhoods will push up the you know, attractiveness of the community. So there's, there's an in, I think that there's, there's interesting work that can be done there. I think looking at the real data around what, what happens after rezoning um, or even after sort of a, a lack of rezoning, right? After there's been a period of time where there wasn't people where properties were not built out to capacity and then suddenly you started to see properties built out to capacity, that's an interesting point to do. I just wanted to add one other thing because we talked a lot about kind of regulations and political reasons that things are hard to do in New York City. Um, speaking about markets, I think it's really important to note that uh, the rental market is basically anti-transparent and it's very, very difficult for a renter on the market to get accurate information about where they're trying to rent, what the neighborhood uh, is traditionally rented for, what apartments that are comparable have rented for in the past. That sort of historical information is essentially not accessible, or if it is accessible, it's for like this tiny slice that is actually not particularly representative. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a really amazing opportunity to, um, I don't know, I mean, maybe this is not true, but I do think that the existing stock of housing would actually be more affordable if there was better information about it and if the market operated more efficiently. It's an extremely inefficient market. And I think that that is something that, you know, data can help with. All right, so we're running out of time. I'm going to ask for, we have one more? No? Uh, let's do this. How many people have questions? Raise your hands high. I want to count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Uh, so let's, let's say we have, we'll take one more question and then our panelists hopefully will uh, hang out afterwards. Can, can, we, can we do this? Can we, can we do five, like ask, get like five questions from the audience and then have the panelists kind of like choose and, and pick? Sure. Yeah? yeah. All right. Sure. You want to pick out my five? <laughs> Who are the people that have the, yeah, the five questions? Just so that way we can make sure that we get some diversity here. So we're going to go for the people in the back. So uh, the one in the white shirt, the gray shirt, the two ladies here, and then the yellow shirt. How about that? All right, so go in the back. So what's the relationship between affordable housing and affordable Now the next one. Oh, me. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of coming from kind of the related to like the specific um, projects, like especially the KPU going out as really interesting ways to kind of like get into these data sets and ask the right questions. I was wondering either if you guys have more specific ideas um, for ways to work with these data sets or maybe general techniques for getting that better context to know the right questions to ask. Okay. Uh, so I'm great new to this. I guess I want you guys to state what is your like goal. Like, what is like the holy grail here for this situation? And given that like you know we have a lot more income inequality, like how does is basically is the goal to have everyone have affordable housing? And with increased income inequality, how does that work? Great. These two ladies. Um, in talking about transparency in the market, how do we deal with the fact that increased transparency might negatively impact tenants who can be discriminated? for prior evictions, uh, for issues like prior HPD complaints made against prior landlords. So as we make this information more transparent, how do we, from a regulation and policy standpoint, offset the fact that we might be increasing discrimination against tenants? Uh, my question is for me about development projects. Uh, do you consider uh, passive house standards or enterprise green community uh, guidelines about echo houses, uh, you know, affordable housing? Because from one point of view, these houses are more expensive to build, but they have long-term benefits in terms of the tenants don't need to pay a lot for electricity, heating, air conditioning, etc. We have 10 minutes now. Okay. <laughs> so perhaps we should start with the uh, ultimate goal question. What is the ultimate goal we're trying to go for here? So you can answer a big question like that in a couple huh. sentences. All right, I'm going to get to do the ultimate goal question and I'm going to throw yours on too because I can answer that easily. <laughs> um, so I think 
for for Canva and for what I care about. Um, you know, I think there's a few measures of what the ultimate goal is, right? Uh, one of them is I'd like to see less, fewer people who are homeless as a need of shelter, right? I think we as a city can bring that down. <laughs> I think that we we can have fewer people who um, cannot find a place to live. Period. Um, I'd also like to see a smaller share of people who are paying extreme portions of their income towards rent, right? So there's lots of solutions to that. One of them could be to ignore housing costs entirely and figure out how to help people make more money, right? Problem solved. <laughs> and, and quite frankly, I'm a little agnostic to it. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's the kind of end result that, that we're looking for. Um, your quick question about the Enterprise Green Centers, all of our building is to Enterprise Green and lead at various levels. We have, because, and this is kind of a nonprofit or for-profit thing maybe, um, we, uh, we own and we operate our buildings. So we care about the long-term costs and the energy efficiency savings that we see of making those investments up front are absolutely borne out over and over again. We also really are careful to make sure that we use um, low toxicity paint and all of these other kinds of helpful <coughs> considerations because we are providing housing to people who have special needs, many people have chronic health conditions, and following those kind of green standards also helps increase the health of our residents who are living in our buildings. And so this is an interesting question. I'll, I'll answer it this way. There is uh, a, a question which is, no matter when any of you moved to New York City, and I don't care if it was in 1893, you heard this city is too expensive and there's an affordable housing crisis. Um, and it has steadily gotten worse and worse and worse and there's a little bit of fatigue and there's a little bit of a question of like, what makes this affordable housing crisis different from all other affordable housing crises? <laughs> um, and there's another thing you hear which is that, you know, it, it starts to move up the chain. It starts to affect everybody and it's not just a low income problem anymore, it's a moderate middle income problem. Um, and those are kind of a couple of, a couple of things that I deal with every day. Um, and my response to that is really that um, the affordable housing crisis affects different people differently. Everybody thinks they should have a better housing situation than they do in New York, unless you know, you're lucky enough to buy a co-op or sign a rent stabilized lease a while ago. But everybody thinks that they don't have enough liquidity in, in, in the market. Um, so what happens is if you're talking about you know, moderate middle income folks, uh, you, know, you start to make choices. You move to a different neighborhood, you get a smaller place, you live with roommates, you cut out other expenses. Um, but there are choices. Once you get down to, you know, the, I don't want to get too wonky, but you, once you get down to low income folks, um, you, start to have, you, you, you start to not have choices. Um, and what we're seeing and what makes this affordable housing crisis different from all others is since 2007 until now, we've seen an enormous uptick in homelessness and an enormous uptick in overcrowding. Overcrowding is up 20% uh, in just six years. And that's, that's the end result of the squeeze, is, is homelessness and overcrowding. Um, and you know, I'm a firm believer that that's the problem to be addressed first. Uh, and that, you know, once, once you focus on that, you know, may, that starts to move up the chain and maybe, you know, that benefits everybody and you get more housing choice in, you know, the, in, in the middle ranges, you can buy a home instead of rent or what have you, but I, I think that unless we really focus on, uh, on folks who don't have housing choice, even, you know, even bad housing choices, that we're, that that's the ultimate goal, is that that's where the policy priority needs to be. So, uh, do you guys want to have? Oh, okay. Ultimate goal. Yeah, that's that's tough. Um, I I guess I would just speak in super broad terms and say that the ultimate goal is for everyone to have the right to have an affordable home. Um, and um, yeah, one in five Americans pay over fifty percent of their income for their home, and um, that is not sustainable for many 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 communities across the country and across our city. And um, so that's the ultimate goal, for people to be able to pay 30% or less of their income on their housing. Um, I mean, I think for me the ultimate goal is um, that we should have information available that allows uh, for transparency in transactions that uh, developers have made with government and the contracts that people who own properties um, kind of are bound by. 
So, I mean, in particular, you know, if you actually, I have a couple of friends who've, you know, gotten their rent histories for stabilized apartments or apartments that were formerly stabilized, and I have yet to find an apartment that was destabilized for reasons that weren't fishy. Um, and it's crazy because this is all information that exists, can be looked at without violating basic privacy tenants if you're careful. You don't need to publish at all. Um, you can look at stuff building by building and identify very clear trends and patterns. And um, there is no mandate for enforcement for the stabilization program. Um, it just, they're basically, it doesn't exist. There's a little bit that's done, but it's hardly anything. It's all on the tenant to figure out that they live in an apartment that should be in the program. Um, and there's other examples of that too in the way that it is often a kind of messy trail and sometimes things go wrong in um, other subsidies or in actual subsidies. Um, so to have transparency around that and to allow people to look at data that would suggest places where things have gone wrong and take action based off that, empower community organizations in particular, that would be the ultimate goal. So it sounds like uh, reducing human suffering by this ailment that is housing. Making sure everyone that has housing or needs housing gets housing. Um, I maybe have one more chapter I remember we talking about this morning this other, which is that, um, you know, I think fundamentally this focus on people who are, are at the bottom of the most sort of dire situation is, is also um, a focus on what we think is so valuable in New York City, right? You actually need to focus on the bottom of the market in order to have a diverse city, right? We could certainly just have a city that has occupied all of these housing units, right? And say like, you know what, we're gonna, our fight is actually gonna be against the right shelter. We're just gonna ship everybody who doesn't have enough money out, right? Like, but that actually I think is not the kind of city that we want. And so this, this focus around housing is actually focused around making sure that there's a place for people who are low income and who are working hard and are trying to survive in New York City to, to be here. Um, and I think that's kind of the other trend. Right, there's definitely a lot of like ethical and moral arguments to unpack in terms of why we should do affordable housing. Uh, John, do you think you could speak to uh, our, the audience question about like what's some low hanging fruit projects that someone interested in getting started in this might be able to? Um, I mean, I feel like we brought up a couple. I actually kind of wanted to turn that question over to the people who are more in the sure. industry, so to speak. I, I mean, I, I can only reiterate some things that were said before. I mean, I think Caitlin's point about tracking, essentially tracking on a neighborhood level um, uh, added housing supply versus uh, market, you know, essentially the market, is is something a lot of people have been trying to do for a while, and the, the main obstacle is really loose data. Um, it's especially on the rent side because you know, in New York City, you have all these rent stabilized units, you have all these publicly subsidized units, and all of those rents that aren't really driven by the market at all are all kind of surveyed and counted. And when you get down to the amount of just actual free market rentals, A, the market is already so distorted, and B, the, the number is too small, the geography is too small to do anything valuable with it. Um, so kind of trying to crack that, getting enough data that you can work with, so you can do more neighborhood level analysis of, you know, not just construction versus cost, but of, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff um, to, to kind of look at what neighborhoods are affected, which ways by what kind of different things is, would be great. Um, but it's a, it's a data question. Um, the other one is like state data on eviction. Uh, you know, we're not the only ones trying to work on and that would, you know, I think that's gonna be a very big thing that's happening. Um, and then the third one is if, uh, you know, we want to try to get that survey data from HPD in terms of the folks who have filled out uh, applications for affordable housing. I think that would be an incredible source of, of a lot of data where you could figure out a lot of things that aren't building and parcel and, and kind of built environment related, but things that are much more human related in terms of what you're trying to figure out. There's one thing I wanted to, oh, sorry. Oh, just a quick note on the first one, a uh, source I didn't mention, the, uh, as part of getting the tax bills, there's also these um, income expense reports that the Department of Finance generates, which are an annual look into approximately how much the income of a building was versus its expenses. For larger buildings, 10 or more units, it's actually based on real filings by the landlord about 
what their rent roll was. Um, and that could be an interesting place to look. It's not exactly accurate, but it would be an interesting place to look for building level rent roll information um, that's also historical and annual. And just to maybe follow on to your question about so how, how do we figure out how to create uh, data access or tools that can be useful for the people who actually need them? Um, you know, I'm certainly happy to talk more. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that in reality, there's a lot of people who are working in New York City on these issues, and would be happy to. You know, we could go to housing court together. <laughs> you can talk to all of the people who are providing legal services and who really understand. You know, Understanding the day-to-day -day and the kind of granular level services and set of restrictions and policies that everybody's interacting with, I think is kind of the right way to start and matching it with, okay, so what macro level data exists that can help um, connect the challenges that are, you know, all of these folks are experiences, uh, experiencing on the individual level. Um, and I'll just say the other kind of sort of project area that I think, you know, which touches on what John was saying in terms of transparency in the rental market, um, you know, there really is just an entire lack of usable information on what, on market straight market rents, and it's out there. I mean, everybody's apartments are, are rented via Craigslist, right? It's just that there's no rational way to take that information and connect it to uh, some of the other like real government information. Um, and so, I think that I would love to know, uh, you know, how people can get more and better information and pair some of these government sources for, you know, uh, complaints and you know, housing quality indicators with um, just the, you know, existing apps that people are using to help find a rental. Um, so I think that there's probably a potential out there and I think that there, the challenge is that there's not necessarily, if you're focusing on the low end market, um, a great market impetus to want to solve this problem, right? You're just, I don't see a great way to make money on it. Um, but I do think that there would be value to, uh, to the people who are trying to solve these problems. Um, and then our uh, final couple questions was related to, uh, the, remind me again, sorry. Oh, uh, just for making sure you get the potential tasks. Yeah. No, it's huge. This is, where, this is where we have, like, you know, this is such a double-edged sword, right? I would never advocate for uh, eviction histories for individuals to be uh, you know, publicly available. Um, so I, I don't have a great solution there. I mean, I think that our focus has been on buildings and ownership and landlords, but you're right. And there's, you know, one of the sort of advantages of the lack of market transparency in the rental market is that it's actually one of the rare places where your history doesn't necessarily follow you everywhere for the rest of your life. And I, you know, certainly as um, you know, an organization that represents tenants, we would be very hesitant to do anything that might change that. It's, and I apologize, I have to go after this. I mean, I, I am a firm believer that non-transparency benefits those with money and access and power. And as, as somebody who has worked you know, in the development world, the, the public is, and tenants are, is always behind the development community in terms of knowledge in the landlord community. Um, so in terms of making things transparent, I think there are you know, issues um, with that, but on kind of an overall macro level, the the you know the landlords are always going to get that information before the tenants, and the you know the folks with money and power are always going to have that access before you know the broad populace. Um, so I always err on the side of transparency, even though those concerns are valid and do come up a lot. Um, and that is kind yeah, of no, a, a good yeah. kind of um, apparition of that is that I believe. Landlords were able to buy yeah. data from the courts? It's pulled out of e-courts, actually. You can look up anybody's name in e-courts right now and find out if they've been sued by their landlord. I see. Yeah. So you can buy that from. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, that just ends up it's concentrating the power in places with money, which is. All right. So I think, uh, I don't think we answered your final question, but perhaps you'll stick around. We can try to get it answered offline. Thank you so much to our panelists for uh, coming and talking to us today. And then thank you to Civic Call uh, and all the organizers at Data NYC for helping out to do this. Thank you, everyone. One, one, one last thing uh, before you leave. Uh, when, you clean, uh, when you get up, uh, please look for any waste, paper cups, lunch, uh, and make sure that it makes it into the back of the room. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, and then if you can, you stack run, your chairs you in the rows that we are. And if anybody wants to help, 
reset the room, it would be appreciated. So thank you. Hi. <laughs> Good. My name is Tom.